My name is Andrew Hunt. I am from The Bullvine. I am the founder of The Bullvine, and we're glad that you could join us today. We are pleased to have our inaugural webinar with uh, Zoetis today, Introduction to Genomics. And with that, we have a very knowledgeable uh, presenter, Cheryl Marty from Zoetis, to present for us today. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining our Introduction to Genomics webinar. As Andrew mentioned, my name is Cheryl Marty, and I work at Zoetis with our genomic test and service called Clarified. For a brief, a brief background about myself, I have a master's in dairy cattle breeding from the University of Wisconsin, and I worked in the industry, uh, the AI industry, for over 12 years prior to joining Zoetis uh, 10 years ago. Genetics has always um, really intrigued me since I was 10 years old and making breeding decisions for my own animals, and so five years ago when Zoetis got involved in dairy genetics with Clarified, it was excited to get back into genetics again. Only this time I get to work with producers directly in helping them achieve their genetic goals on the female side of the equation. So since 2010, I've been fortunate to meet with uh, thousands of herd owners and managers, uh, nutritionists, AI representatives, veterinarians, lenders, bankers, and uh, quite a few more from across the country, all to kind of teach them the value of genomic testing, but to also learn from them as well and hear what their goals are and, and what their desires were. And so I've worked closely then also with a smaller group of herds, uh, about 100 of them, in establishing their genomic strategies and plans to meet their goals. Um, part of that includes evaluating their inventory and economic situations, uh, monitoring their progress, and also their results if they, once they get further into it. And so today I hope to share some of the things that we've jointly learned as to the whys and hows and the basics that go into genomic testing so that you too can consider and begin utilizing clarified or genomic testing. So I thought before I get into the presentation, I thought it's important to establish what this webinar series will not be about. First of all, this is not going to be about marketing cattle. Marketing is really not the goal, nor is it part of the conversations that we're having with dairy producers. Uh, marketing cattle has a lot of different aspects to it that are not always genetic or goal-based. So in our presentations, we're going to purely focus on herd goals. Nor is this going to be about a single cow example. We will not get into particular why an animal is high or low in a particular trait. Nor is it our goal to pan for gold, as my colleague David Earth might point out. So again, we're going to be focused on herd goals and herd progress. This also is not going to be about bulls. While good sire selection is a very important piece in genetic progress, our focus is really on the female populations. The female populations are a lot different and a more normal distribution than any other heavily selected bull population that you might hear about in a lot of the, the media. Cow and heifer populations and herds do follow what we call a normal distribution curve, so really there's no, virtually no bias within herd populations that you have. And so we see herds achieve what we're going to expect from the popula genetic population dynamics. So again, these webinars are intended to expose you to some of these new ideas then, um, so you can have a new way of thinking and perhaps consider this technology. So it will be more about the uh, game-changing technology called genomics. And really, this can be applied in most dairies. And with this, we will focus our discussions around whole herd genetic improvement. Again, whole herd genetic improvement. It's really just like a vaccination protocol that you might use on a dairy and how you apply it to all the animals as part of a plan, and in this case, just a genetic plan. And it's important because Clarified is an important prevention and performance improvement plan for any dairy. So we're going to focus on females because they're, they are what you control and you own, and really they're most, your most important asset and money-making machine on your dairy. And really, you know, you think about it, you have to live with them, you have to work with them, you milk them, you deal with them every day. So you, you, you really probably want the ones that you want. And we know that they're just not all created equal. So that's why I think there's a good incentive for you to invest in, in this technology. So to introduce our webinar series, this is the first of seven webinars that's going to discuss various aspects of genomics. First of all, we are a company that is based on strong R&D or research and development where science and data drive much of what we do. And genomics is really about data and science. 
So this is the first presentation. We'll review a lot of the base information of the hows and the whys of genomic testing. And after this one, we'll have a topic dedicated to showing you proof of how the technology works on real dairies, particularly in comparison to parent average. Then the third topic will be on the various strategies that, you can, be, that can be used to accelerate genetic progress in your herd. Then followed by a very popular topic on the various economic aspects of genomic testing and how it pays for itself, because it isn't for free. And then we'll hear how to put genomic results to work and some aspects of InLight, which we uh, utilize with the Holston Association USA. And then after some of those basics, we'll move into topics related to questions that we come across, one of which revolves around using phenotypes, such as average daily gain or size-based traits in common with um, decisions on dairies. So we'll look at that. And then we'll also dedicate a topic to looking at genetic progress of low heritability traits specifically, such as daughter pregnancy rate, somatic cell, and so forth. So we'll hopefully continue to join us for future webinars or come back to the Bovine website for the recordings if you're not able to make it live. So on to the agenda for today. We're going to talk about what genomics are and how do they work. We'll go into why might you want to invest in genomic testing. We'll go into just some of the basics of genetic and genetic progress. We'll look through reliability and how it increases confidence because that's really what you're paying for. Then we'll go into how would you go about genomic testing if you decided to start today or tomorrow. Um, and then go a little preview of next month. So let's get going. So what is genomics and how does it work? To start with, I thought it would be good to review a few definitions. First of all, genetics is simply the study of heredity. Or I think of it as what genes get passed on from, uh, from your parents to yourself or yourself to your children. The genome, then, is the complete set of DNA that an organism has, such as a cow or a person or a cat or dog or any really organism. And it just includes all of the genes. Genomics, then, is the branch um, that is concerned with structure, the function, the evolution, and just the mapping of all of these genomes. So what do they mean? You know, what's the end result? So taking that the, the DNA and understanding what it means in, in numbers that you might understand better. We know that most genes or many genes impact various phenotypes that we're selecting for, such as milk. So it's not just a single gene type of a thing that we're looking for. We have to look at several genes from several chromosomes. So therefore, some of the older technologies that looked at one gene site or a couple didn't really capture the full impact of let's say, protein improvement to make good genetic progress. So genomics is different than those older technologies. It looks at the whole genome in various ways, depending which technology and data is used. So let's talk about genetics again, go into some real examples. So if you take simply a, a, a bull that you might be considering to use and a cow, what kind of a result are you going to get? What are you going to get? You have lots of different possibilities, right? So maybe another question might be is, how many possible unique individuals could arise from the same parent? I'd love to do a poll here, but it might take a little while with the number of people. But just think about how many unique individuals might there possibly be. Well, it's a very big number. It's over a quintillion. So there's a lot of potential possibilities. So it's impossible to know which animal is created at conception. We just can't predict that. I mean, take a look at your siblings if you have some. Are you all alike? Of course not. And that's, you know, yes, we're, we generally might get what our parents are if you have thousands of siblings or thousands of offspring from the same sire and dam. But we, we know that some offspring will be better than average, and we'll also have some that are not even close to the parents. And you go, what happened there? And we also know that an animal is hardwired at conception as to their genetics. So genomic testing simply identifies which gene an animal is re, uh, receives from their parents. And again, this which one is created is unpredictable and what we call Mendelian sampling phenomena. So let's look at a real herd example. This shows you just genomics again, how you might, uh, what you learn and how you sort through the genes from each of the parents. So you can see here on the left-hand side, we have our traditional parent average net merit dollars. And I use net merit dollars simply because it's a, a profit-related trait. And if we look at 
just one group in the middle and it's taken 300 net merit dollars. If we think that's what they are, well, in the end, once we genomic test them, we actually identify that there's some animals that are really only zero in comparison, and there's some as high as 600. So we get a very big variation once we get to the DNA, look under the hood of a cow, and find out what genes she actually got from the parent. You can see this actually carries throughout the various um, parent average ranges. If you also look at which are the highest ones in the end, so these are the highest genomic net merit dollars, you can see they don't always come from the very top parent average animals. So if you're trying to pan for gold, you're going to miss a lot of animals here that are um, you know, below the herd average for parent average. So that can happen. That is what Mendelian sampling does. So when we do talk about genetics, I also want to point out that we're really trying to explain what this variation is in outcomes. So the phenotype here is an outcome and could be things like milk production, stays open, stature, or anything else. It's basically what do we see? What are, you, what are they doing in your herd as far as performance? And what comprises phenotype then are two portions. One of them is environment, or what I'll sometimes call as environmental noise. And from research and millions of records of information, we can identify and explain some of this. So this is the known portion of environment. This is what we attempt to do when we're doing contemporary groups with a herd effect in breed evaluations, and also adjusting for parameters such as um, age of the animal when she calves, the season of calving, because we know that all impacts milk production. But there's some factors that we don't know, we can't quantify, that contribute to the uncertainty of the environment. So Maybe one animal gets pneumonia and one doesn't. Well, the system doesn't know those types of things, and so we have an unknown component there. Overall, the better our management is, the more consistent our environment is, which means that the genetics are just going to express themselves even better than what we'd expect um, as compared to the numbers that we're given. So again, if you have good management, this, this technology is even going to give you more back than what we're going to show in some of the economics down the road. Now, on the genetic side, that's, uh, also, of course, the, the part that we're interested in. We can partition, partition it into additive gene effects, where the additional copies, if you make more of these favorable genes, it's going to contribute to a better phenotype, and that's what we're measuring. The non-additive effects, which are difficult to measure at times, are variable and include things such as heterosis, gene-by-environment interactions, and gene-by-gene -gene interactions. So we're unable to really share that with you, and we can't pass it on from generation to generation, which is why they're not considered in the additive piece. Okay. Next slide then just shows that heritability then is the um, is the proportion of this total variation, or total variation is a phenotype that is explained by this portion only. So this is what we're measuring within our genetic evaluations. And traditional and genomic evaluations and basically just trying to get that, that piece of it. We also know, and you'll see evidence in our second webinar, is that heritability varies from herd to herd. The better managed your herd is, actually, the higher the heritability is and the more you're going to get out of genetics. And also all the economics we're going to show on the fourth topic will be based on average herd. So again, herds with better than average management are going to get actually more economic benefit from it as well. Okay, let's talk about the genetic evaluation process. It's important to understand what goes into this. So first of all, if you have a young animal, the most information you may know about it is the pedigree, so basically the sire and the dam. Of course, this does assume that parent is accurate, but we know this isn't true. Um, in thousands of records, we see about 15% of the animals we've tested have not had the right sires. And if we have this information available, the pedigree information, we might call this parent average, which is basically half of the sire and half of the dam, or a pedigree index, which is the sire and maternal grandsire commonly. Often some of this parent average information can be hard to find, and it's um, even a very rough estimate because sometimes the dam is a two-year-old or first calving, and she doesn't even have performance information yet, or it's very, very early. So different additional information that goes into the genetic evaluation process, or excuse me, first of all, what comes out of this is that parent average, and the, the reliability on that can be very, very low. We see it on the records roughly um, 20 to 30 percent. 
Now, if we start to include in additional information, such as production and type classification information once they've calved and have been milking a while, that will go into what we call PTAs. And being on DHA test just contributes to all of this and adds to the reliability of the information. So phenotypes also do drive genomic evaluations and is really a double check and a checks and balances system that we, we need continually going forward beyond just genomics. So the reliabilities that you might get here are, are um, I've seen in the 40s to 50s, and if you get up to five lactations, it might get into the 60s. So finally, we also have a GPTA or a genotype that we can, we can also measure now with genomic testing. It includes all of the things we described, if they're available, plus it now takes the actual genotype in there. So that's our GPTA. For young calves, of course, they may not have performance data in this GPTA, but it has genomics and their pedigree if it's known and identified. And their sire and dam also gets included in all three of these things if they're available. Now I want to go back to talking about the genome a little bit and share how the geno genotype portion is evaluated. First of all, dairy cattle have 30 chromosomes. And amongst those chromosomes are millions of SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, polymorphisms. That's a big word to explain. But the SNPs, much easier to say, are a DNA sequence variation that occurs commonly within a population. And if you remember back to biology, you may also recall hearing about A, C, G, or T, or what's known as adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. So each SNP represents a single difference in a single DNA building block, which, which those are those nucleotides. Now the chips then used for genomic testing are various sizes and have varying number of SNPs. And so the SNPs though measure different parts of the DNA that are more commonly known to have variation of the genes at a different location and are established distances between each other. It's almost like thinking it like mile markers on the road where they're at established distance. We also know that DNA is transmitted in chunks, and, a crossover, and crossovers don't occur at every site. That's why we're able to do this, this testing with even a little bit lower, not having measuring every single um, DNA SNP. So genomic testing then identifies which DNA chunks get passed on from parent to offspring, and then bases that on large, based on large phenotypic databases and a lot of other animals being genotype, USDA then, CDCB, calculates our GPTAs in the US. And the more data that goes into the system, the stronger and the better the GPTAs are going to be. So let's talk about that part next. When genomics came out, there were quite a few producers that I talked to that were very unsure of the unknown and really didn't know what genomics was about or what it could do for them. So there was a lot of hesitation at first. But if we really think about what goes into genomic evaluations, they're just really a result of many familiar things. And first of all, I do like to think in layman's terms of what genomics are. And I like to describe the technology as taking a DNA marker that's available and matching it to what we know in the genetic information that we've learned through a lot of traditional methods of evaluation over the many years. So to me, it's grounded in things that we've been familiar with. So going back, we've already had evaluations back to 1936 in the US, and then since then there's been many, many years and millions of DHI records and breed classification that records. So that has been really the foundation that has gone into genomic testing, and now it's just matched up with the DNA markers for those that have the DNA. And then based on that, in 2009, the first genomic evaluations became official in the US and people began purchasing genomic tested bulls. The test cost at that time was over $200 an animal, so it was very limiting as to who would use that, and it's most, it was mostly at that time used in elite cattle or those um, animals that were hoped to be very elite. But in 2010, actually in August of 2010, things changed dramatically when a 3K chip was um, introduced, which has 3,000 little snips on there, 3,000 mile markers you might think of it as. And since that time, it's increased in chip sizes as well. Um, so this has been a very instrumental play, uh, thing that's really evolved the technology and made it available to really any dairy producer that has cattle, purebred cattle. 
and other industries have utilized this even longer and have been very important competitive strategies. So that's been in the poultry and the swine industries. And then if you think about it, genomics really is just like a forage test, for example, which you can see here. So it gives you a ton of information. And you wouldn't feed cattle just any old silage without knowing what it is. You've got to balance it with everything else to make it right for the cow. So it's the same thing. You want to know what you have with your, your cow um, before you, you know, make major investments to raise every single animal. It's almost like getting a Carfax. If you're familiar with a Carfax, of course, uh, you wouldn't buy a car without a Carfax and knowing the history on it. So I like to think of genomic testing as a cow fax, because you're finding out about the DNA of the animal and what is her potential, what are her chances to really making you money and making you a good investment. So genetics is unique from all of the things that I can think of on a dairy as well. Genetics are permanent. So permanency, you can't change it. So once conception occurs, it's done. You can't change that. It can only get worse as far as their performance down the road. You've got their full potential once the conception occurs. Genoma, genetics are also additive. So what you do today, half of those genes get passed on the next generation and half again the next generation. So you have to make good decisions all the way along. In addition, genetics are rate limiting. So you can't get 40,000 pounds of milk out of a cow that's hardwired to only make 20,000 pounds of milk. So again, genetics are kind of your maximum full potential. So what do you get then from genomics that's maybe above and beyond genetics? Well, the number one thing is to get more confidence in having more dependable information. The reliability is just higher of that information. So when you have more reliable information, you can make better decisions. You also, when, when you make better decisions, then you're going to improve your profitability and your competitive advantage. So let's look at just uh, you know, what's been the implementation so far in genomic testing in the US. As you can see, back in 2009, most of the animals that were genomic tested were males, indicated by the blue portion. <coughs> but as you've gone along, when we start introducing the, the 3K test or the lower density chips, you can see now that the female population is what's really dominating the uh, testing today. And that's because it's more affordable and you can test all of your animals and still uh, make it work economically. And part of why genomics is also taking off is as more people are understanding genetics is, is foundational. Of course, there's, there's a lot of other management pieces that are important too, but both man management and genetics are important. It's not really an either or situation. Both are important. But genetics is foundational. It's like what I think of a hub of the wheel. It's the center. It's, it's the foundation. It impacts most everything that I can think of, such as reproduction, milk quality, milk production, animal health, calf and heifer growth. I mean, all of those things it impacts. So genomics offers new ways to be innovative, become more efficient, and profitable in the end. So now I like to do a little exercise. And I'd like you to close your eyes and think about what is your most profit cow and what does she look like? Close your eyes, think about what does that cow look like to you? Well, a lot of people have a different idea of what is their best cow. So in some people, I used to show cows, um, I might like to show cow for some things. So maybe she's a pretty looking cow. But there's also others, and I also like these an awful lot too because we gotta pay the bills. So what's a profitable cow look like? Or what does a cow with good reproduction look like? Or good even, even good milk quality or good milk production volume? It's really hard to know those things. I mean, you can't, you can't tell that when they're a baby calf. And so, um, you know, just, just thinking about that, it's really genomics gets under the hood again to look at the DNA so that you can have a better idea of what she's going to do down the road for you. And it doesn't matter what your goals are because genomics gives you all of the information and then you weight the traits based on your goals and it can fit any, any dairy. And then you decide how you're going to rank your animals with the information that you receive back. So when I think of genomic testing, in the end, I think it gives three important things. Number one, it gives you confidence to be able to make decisions, number one instead of not doing anything or not making more selections and doing something different, 
it allows you to make a change and achieve more success. And this confidence is possible because genomics is more accurate than doing things the old-fashioned way. While genomics is not precise and it's certainly not perfect, it is very accurate and it can make you faster genetic progress towards your herd goal. Again, I always talk about groups and herd goals and that's really ultimately what we're trying to do with genomic technology. Genomics also allows you to be proactive, kind of like taking a peek at your Christmas presents too early. You want to be able to choose and be proactive which ones you want to raise because it costs a lot of money to raise your animals. And how do you manage your herd genetics? Well, you can manage your animals differently if you know more about them at a young age. Instead of waiting for you to find out, yeah, I like this five-year-old cow that I have, but I have one heifer calf or none out of her, you could have known that as early as birth and made a decision that I'm going to do some embryo work on her and get lots of heifers before she's, it's too late. So what a great thing to be proactive, and I can't think of anything else in a dairy that gives you that opportunity. So I'd like to say confidence, accuracy, proactiveness, or CAP, to make faster and better decisions. Okay, so there are various genomic testing types available to you. First thing you want to know is that genomic testing can be done in most breeds of animals, minus crossbreds, where there's a few new breeds being added in um, soon. But we're currently offering this uh, clarified test with to Holsteins, Jerseys, and Brown Swiss. And the main test utilized by our customers is called Clarified. This is a custom tip that we use right now that was developed with Illumina, the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding, the USDA, and Holstein Association, and which has evolved from some even lower density chips in the past. The industry, as I mentioned before, started with a 3K low density chip, which gave Holsteins about a 60% reliability. When we they went then to the 6K or 6,000 SNPs, we saw a nice bump up in reliability. And then we went to the 12K, which are, was our first custom chip. We saw another additional bump in reliability. And today our 19K test is 99.8% as accurate as the 50K or higher density chips that we've called Clarified Ultra, which is another offering that we have. And this Clarified Ultra also has evolved from the industry's first 50K chip which a lot of the base research was done on. So the 19K test is uh, quite substantial in what it can do and um, provides a very high reliability for, for the price. And all of the genomic testing information that we're supplying in our products are official and are calculated by CDCB, USDA, and the Holstein Association, which is a very important piece. Now, of course, there are currently other test options on the market as well. So it's critical to ask some good questions, understand what you would get from the different types of tests that are out there, especially when it comes to some of the new ultra-low density chips that are on the market that are under 10,000 SNPs or 10K. So some of the questions you might ask is whether or not the data is official. You also may ask, want to ask, are the genomic results calculated or who is calculating it and how do they validate the information to remain relevant and current? It may also be important for you to understand the importance of, of the test in correcting parentage or providing genomic conditions, as they all vary in that respect, both of which allow you to manage risks of inbreeding and match unwanted recessive genes when you're doing the matings on them. So one of the big learnings we had early on was that parentage is not what we think, and so that is a big benefit when it is offered as part of the test, apart from also the gain and reliability you get with a little bit higher chip SNPs. So um, let's see, we also hope that you can get um, take great care because it's more than just the test, um, but just again, ask good questions before you make your investment and also know it's also service that comes with it that is a really important piece. So what do you get with Clarified? With one test, again, you can, you can take a DNA sample at birth and get it back a few weeks later. And you can know just a plethora of information. As you can see here, we get production traits back, we get health and reproduction traits, calving abilities, we have type traits, all that you want there for mating programs. We can keep on um, doing the parentage and the inbreeding. We find all that information. We can find out coat colors, um, pulled genes, all of the other recessives. We can get into the milk proteins. 
And in the end, we really want to get down to one number. And there are some great industry traits out there, such as net merit or TPI for Holsteins. So those sometimes are the ones that people go to that take into account a lot of these things that you're already seeing in the list. So why invest in genomic testing? Well, first of all, if we think about the industry in general and the future challenges that we have to feed the world, in 50 years from now, the population is going to require 100% more food because it's just sort of the growth. That's twice as much as we have today. There's going to be a lot more people and a lot, lot higher middle class. Um, and then if we think about that, how are we going to get there? We don't have any more land to have crops grown on, so we're going to have to do more with less. And 70% of this food is going to have to come from efficiency improving technologies, which is exactly how genomics fits in. It improves the efficiency. It's going to help you do more with less and continue to speed up our ability to do that. So genomics does speed up genetic progress towards our goal, and whatever that goal is, whether it's net merit, TPI, or something else. So this herd here is a real herd example from our Enlight system that we developed with the Holstein Association. And until the herd has, um, you can see here, early in the years, they had the same, they were just a little bit above average, and they consistently kept that up. But as you can see, when they started adopting the, the sires and then in the, the genomic testing, you can see how they're pulling away from the average of the crowd. So the earlier you adopt, the more that you're going to start to move ahead of others. It's almost like investing in your 401k. Um, the earlier you start, the better off you're going to be and have more saved up in the end. And it's going to take a lot less catching up versus somebody that starts later. Genomics also allows us to have confidence in managing herd replacement inventory. If we think about how long it takes to recover our heifer raising costs, one of the estimates I received from Agstar Financial is that it takes uh, 31,000 pounds of milk before she's recovered all of the cost to raise her and the ongoing cost of production to, to produce that milk. So that's typically going to be a second lactation cow. And actually, I've seen this number has gone up in recent years. So that's, that's a second lactation cow. And we know not all cows make it to second lactation. Well, another um, study done by D uh, Dave Galligan and Jim Ferguson in Pennsylvania, they also did a study back in 95, and they found the same thing. Again, you don't start actually making money on a single animal until they're in their second lactation. So we better make sure that we're raising the right animals. So all in all, genomics then changes many herd management paradigms and dynamics once you start using the results. It's really changed a lot of those paradigms, like you don't have to raise every heifer, and you don't have to breed the heifers the same way or use the same type of semen on them. Now we can do a lot of different things. We can do sex semen. We can do IVF on heifers. We can even use more beef on the very low animals and just, or just not raise them at all. So those that have adopted tech that want to be more and remain competitive and not have their environment change on them or they want to be proactive instead of finding themselves where the cheese has moved on them, if you've read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? So the benefits that have been sought by producers have um, been many. So genetics really is the core to improving efficiency. Um, you may have, again, limited resources. Even if you are expanding, there's still a limit to what you have available to you. So as in the past, more efficient producers will remain the dominant players in the future, and genomics can help with this, help any herd size. Genomics can also then um, manage inventory to help improve cash flows. And to some, they also look at this as a way to reduce their environmental load. You know, they're going to have a little less manure if they're not raising every single heifer. Also, herds are choosing to be more proactive versus reactive. They'd rather not have a fire engine business, but they would rather be proactive in making decisions so someone else doesn't have to do it for them. In the end, whole herd long-term prevention and performance plan is another big reason herds are going to this. We don't want to be just treating sick cows. We want more healthy, high productive, long lived cows. And this genomic test is available to really anyone and allows you to do this all faster and better. So understanding genomic, uh, genetic progress is also the cornerstone of the why, how, and the economics that goes into this. So it's the foundation. So this is the only formula that I'm going to show today. 
But genomic impact can be large, depending again on you and your choices. It's all about, again, improving this, making this better for you and faster, You're doing it faster. Genomics, first of all, brings you more accuracy. That's really what you're paying for. So you've got better accuracy of information um, as reflected in the reliability that you see. The reliability is, again, gained from about 25 to 70 for Holsteins on a net merit basis. But selection intensity is also very important. You have to do something with technology. Otherwise, this number is zero, making the genetic progress also zero on the female side. So you've got to do something with it. So you've got to, if you're getting more females from last or not raising all your heifers, that's one way. Or the strategy to choose and the reproductive efficiencies that you have will give you more abilities to be more selective if you have a bigger heifer crop to pick from. There's one other piece here that I'm not highlighting, but genetic generation interval may also come into play if more females are coming from your heifers versus your cows. But that's probably where the real gain is on the sire side as compared to the female side. So most of the things that you're going to gain on your herd of cattle is going to be from improving your accuracy and doing something with it and giving, having more ability to be choosy in the choices that you make. Again, let's look at a real herd and look at what, what is, what's, uh, what's examples here. Again, if we look at pre-genomics, so before 2009 calves are born, we were in this herd seeing uh, an improvement in net merit dollars per year of $35, which is a very acceptable number. But then if you went to once the sire selection was possible and you could choose more genomic tested bulls and that information was more accurate, you can see now the impact of that in blue. You can see now that that slope and improvement has improved now, instead of $35 a year, it's jumped to $50 a year improvement from a PTA perspective. And what's even greater is that when you started to genomic test, as this herd did, they started to genomic test some of the animals in 2011 and all of them in 2012. So their offspring then were born in 2013 and on. And as you can see, the slope increased even more so and now this herd is achieving $74 a year genetic progress rather than $35. That's more than double what they were doing before genomic technology was available. And that's huge. And when you look at that, that difference, it's actually closer to, let's see, 40, it's almost $80 a year more profit that you're gonna have from each animal born. So big, big numbers. Some also have, I've also heard some people say that, well, their genetics are good enough and I just need to do better in my, my management, that they think that their genetics are good enough. But it's really not true. There's still a long way to go. And this is some information I got from Paul Van Reading at USDA. And he basically showed here with the genomics that we know today, the highest possible Anna would be 6,700 net merit dollars. And we're seeing most animals averaging around two or 300 in their herds today. So we've got a long ways to get there. Lots of opportunities remain. Now let's talk a little bit more about why reliability increases our confidence. I thought I'd go through a little example here. If we, uh, first of all, had perfect information for reliability, we'd have 100%. But we never see 100% as a reliability on our genetic data, not even on bulls. We do see some bulls at 99% reliability, but it does take a long time to get there, and it takes tens of thousands of daughters to get this level of accuracy. So often it's just too late by the time you get there for, um, for them to, to really use them a lot, and it's definitely not even possible for females. They're very, very, very rare. I think I saw one cow at 98. So again, they're just very old um, and gone by the time you get there. Another situation, so let's think about you're selling some cattle, somebody comes by or you're buying. If you randomly stop at a herd and pick out the next 10 that are going to be freshened, you're randomly selecting them there. And you might get the, good, the best one, you might get the worst one, and everything in between. And to me, there's, there's no reliability in doing that, and you're not helping yourself. Well, when my grandpa was purchasing his first registered cattle back in 1940s, he bought 13 cows, and for him, there was really no information available other than what you could see and what the farmer told him. So his reliability of information was extremely low and it was basically what he could see and what he could trust on. 
But when my dad started uh, dairying and took over the farm with his brother, he had more information to go by. PTAs were now available, and therefore you could have a parent average or pedigree information on the young stock. But it was still low reliability. It was still in that 25 to 30 range. And again, that assumes perfect parentage, which if it's wrong, it's zero. And finally, now what my sister has to use with her family in making decisions, we have GPTAs available, or genome-enhanced PTAs, where the reliability is now 68 to 70, so a much, much greater opportunity here. And this just shows a graph of the data we've actually evaluated looking at the before and after of the genomic data. So as you can see, for several different traits here, the initial starting point on the traditional reliabilities have been in the low to mid-20s. This, again, is a mix of commercial and registered herds. And then when we come out with the results, we're in the upper 60s to even above 70 for some of the higher heritability traits. So we're gaining a lot of information on, on uh, animals with just one single test. And what's the kind of equivalent as far as in terms of daughter equivalence? If we're thinking about the SNPs, oh, pedigree information might be equivalent for production uh, about six or seven daughters worth. Now, if we get in uh, genomic information, you can see that we're going to get over 30 daughters or close to 32, depending on the reliability back. But you get about 32 daughters worth of information with one genomic test. And if you ask yourself, did I ever get 32 daughters from one cow? it's highly unlikely, right? So you're getting all of this information, this lifetime information, it's one test as early as, as a, a month of age or less. If we go to a high or lower heritability trait like reproduction or daughter pregnancy rate, that gives you even more information than you'd otherwise have. And so it's equivalent to over 130 daughters. Huge, we'd never achieve this alone. So what does that all mean in real terms if you want to look at a real herd example? This is a herd that I began working with early on in genomic testing, and they wanted to look at this. They did this on, um, this is looking at the parent average information, first of all. And let's just say for a moment that our, our ME305 milk production is perfect. It's actually telling us what the, the, gen, the genetics really are behind the scenes. Now, we know this is not perfect, and we know that it's not true, but let's just say for a moment it is. Well, then I made in the colors here, the blue dots are animals that were supposed to be the highest 20% based on parent average milk. I also color the ones in yellow that were supposed to be the lowest 20% for milk. And as you can see, what you would expect, you would hope that more of the yellows are to the left where the lower milk production came out and more blues to the right. But you can see there's a lot of crossover. There's some high expectations that actually end up very poor in milk and vice versa, some low expectations, the yellow dots that actually ended up in the top half of the herd. So parent average probably isn't going to help you make a lot of progress. It might help you move the needle a little bit, but it's not going to get you very far. Now we're going to go next to the same herd, but now looking at GPTAs. So I'm going to go back one, show you once more. Here's parent average. And here's genomic information. Now I've sorted this based on the, the blue dots are the highest 20% based on genomic values for milk versus the yellow dots are the lowest 20% for milk. And as you can see, while it's still not perfect in the middle, you see a lot stronger relationship between the blue dots being to the right and the yellow dots being towards the left. So quite a contrast here. And that's really, if you took those yellow dots out, you would make a lot more progress and you'd move that needle forward. So, okay, let's say you're convinced that this technology is right for you. What are you going to do, or how do you go about genomic testing? So the first decision is to make and decide that you want to do better. You want to do something different, and you're going to move forward. So let's just now say that you say yes. And the next step, then, in the progress, uh, or the process, sorry, is to choose a strategy so that you're going to achieve success. And, go, and you want to pick the goals that are going to go with that. So this is going to be one of our future topics, a whole presentation dedicated to that. But that is the next step in the process. Then it's actually just physically going out, collecting DNA samples from either the hair 
um, using a blood, getting blood and putting it on a blood card or taking a tissue sample, which has become our most popular place. So you can order a lot of things. Um, there's also order forms that would need to be filled out and go with those samples. And this can all be found on www.clarify.com. Or if you're hosting USA member, you can also submit versus, um, through InLight. So once you have a sample submitted and, and you get the uh, you'll get the information back a couple weeks later, and when you get those results back, you want to rank them. Again, as we mentioned earlier, you can rank them based on whatever you want. And then when you have them ranked, then you're going to apply that a strategy that you had in step two. So it's really a simple process. Decide what you're going to do, get the data, rank the animals, and apply it to your strategy. Very, very simple. Okay, we are to our summary. And I just wanted to point out then, in summary, that Clarified um, is a truly game-changing technology that can be used by most herds to improve the ability to more quickly improve your herd's genetics and through all sorts of strategies. And what this is going to do for you in the end, it's going to make you more efficient, more competitive, stay relevant, and be profitable. And those are all good things. And your investment in genetic technology now lasts forever because genetics are permanent and additive. And don't forget that genetics are also rate limiting when you have undesirable genes. So overall, Clarified gives you more confidence in the genetic information you have to work with because it gets under the hood to look at the DNA, which gives you the ability to make better decisions today versus five years down the road when it's too late, all so that you can be more profitable tomorrow. So basically, if you had to summarize it in two words, it just does things faster and better. And genomics has changed paradigms in many herds. And the old standards of good enough have been and will continue to be challenged, such as using parent average. There's just so much better information today to use than we had in the past. And it's equally as important to make changes in your strategies as well. So Clarify can also be the hub of strategic decisions because it impacts most everything about your most important asset which are your cows. And genomics have a lifetime use. You pay it once, and you have it, have it available to use it forever. So don't wait. Start early. And it's never too late to get started. And when you do start to make faster genetic progress towards, with Clarified, you're investing in a faster improvement towards a better herd of cows. So I do want to do a little peek ahead with one more slide to show you what we're going to have coming up in our next webinar. So in our next webinar, we'll, we'll give you a glimpse of looking at how animals originally looked into their genomic results and then how it translates into real production values. Are they getting progress? And then we'll also compare that to how parent average would perform or doesn't perform. So one slide I wanted to share with you here is to get you thinking about this graph, looking at animals ranked on a multi-trait index called net merit. And then think about the possibilities of what you could do if you had 100 animals and let's just say one pan of 20 calves is represented in each of these bars. This being, if we knew, the worst 20% based on net merit dollars up to the very best 20% based on net merit dollars. So you have five pens of 20. And then asking yourself, how would you, knowing this information, that one pen of calves, if you're looking at a five-year-old cow, only 14% of them are still alive, making you money, having calves, at that age versus one another pen of calves has 50% of them still milking, making money, and having babies born. What would that do to your profitability, and how would that change your management style? So um, that will be our, our second topic um, next month. And uh, so now I look forward to hearing your questions. Yes, thanks, Cheryl. Appreciate that greatly. And guys, we've had a lot of questions, so I'm going to just kind of start working through them. Uh, we've had some variations on some uh, similar questions, so you may see uh, some of these questions kind of merged into one and maybe not the exact way you worded it, but they're very similar questions. And in uh, respect to everyone's time, uh, we will kind of merge them together. And one of the most prevalent ones we've had is, uh, you know, uh, the gist of it is that if I'm not uh, selling uh, high-end cattle, um, how does it benefit me as a commercial producer or someone who just makes uh, my revenue from milk uh, to do uh, genomic testing? 
Yeah, well, I think uh, hopefully we just, I don't know if the questions were earlier on, but this is, this is almost more beneficial to non-elite cattle. To me, this is the bread and butter. I mean, this is what it's all about. It's not about elite cattle, as I mentioned early on. It's about making more money, and it's about speeding up the process. So you just have to ask yourself, do I need to raise every single heifer that I have? And selling 10 to 20% of your, your heifers um, can just help you make a lot more progress the next generation. Or using sex semen a lot more on your top heifers and even some of your first lactation cows versus doing it across the board on all heifers when not all the heifers are going to be good. Um, a lot of those things are, you know, applicable to every single herd across the world. So not all animals are created alike, and that's what we're just sorting through what genes you have. You don't have to have elite cattle. In fact, I prefer working with a lot of producers. Most of the animals that we're working with are commercial producers. There are dairies from 50 cows to uh, over 10,000 cows, and they're testing every animal in a lot of those cases. Okay, and viewer 67 asks, uh, how reliable are the newly introduced preliminary genomic, t genomic tests, and how can they benefit my breeding program? Good question. Um, so the, he's referring to the weekly evaluations that come out as compared to the monthly that come out later that are considered final in the U.S. Um, the weekly ones are very, very close, um, especially in the Holstein breed from what I understand. They're very, very close. They're 99% related, maybe even 99.5. I forget what the exact number is, but it is just as accurate. So if you do get something back in the middle of the month and you've got all of the information there, you know, why I would I would sell you know the bottom you're going to be awfully awfully close again the numbers aren't precise they're accurate and so it's about group improvement so you know if you've got some borderline ones maybe look at the calf health or something to go with it um, but in general you know you're going to be able to use those weekly information uh, weekly, weekly results just as confidently as the monthly results. Okay, great. And then I've had a couple of users ask the question about, you know, uh, you mentioned about accuracy. Uh, when most herds start on genomic testing, what is the error in parent averages or parent identification? Is it typically pretty large or what is that on most herds? Yeah, um, it's been all over the board, Andrew. It's uh, It's been kind of a, an a eye opener for a lot of the dairies. So even registered herds, I've seen it, it tends to be a little lower in registered herds, but I'd say more in the smaller number of herds or smaller sized herds, it's a little more accurate. I see 5 to 10% in those. The larger the dairy, that tends to be more, more wrong, 15 to 20%, but we're averaging in our database about 15% sire misidentification, which is what the numbers were told you know, years ago when I was in the AI industry, we just didn't have much to, to prove it. Um, now we've got proof that that's pretty much true. It's about 15% wrong. And I had herds, too, that were actually 80 to 100% wrong when we first started and found out there was a major process step wrong that they since corrected, and now they're in the 10 to 15 wrong, you know. So it has identified um, holes in management. It's identified, you know, a lot of different things. So the, the parentage piece can't be... Uh, downplayed, it's it, it's really a, a key piece to the whole equation. And viewer 144 asks, uh, will the reliability keep increasing uh, and how fast? So the reliability of the genomic results really is going to depend on the entire system. It's more a function of how many um, phenotypes or DHI records are in the system that also have genotypes matched up or how many bulls are in there. Um, it also depends a little bit on the chip size. Um, but again, in, in the end, it's really more about the, um, the amount of data that goes in there. So we can already see major differences in reliability between, let's say, Holstein reliabilities, which are close to 70% for net merit, um, compared to, let's say, um, Ayrshire or even Jerseys, you know, the, the other breeds will be maybe 10% less or maybe even 15% less. And that's strictly, it's not because the system is wrong, it's just because there's less data going into, into the calculations to give meaningful data. Okay. And another so again, question. All, and, all, and all I should add to that too is even though they may not be as high, they're still much, much higher than what the parent averages would be for those different breeds. 
Okay. Another question is, uh, can genomic, uh, viewer 22 asks, can genomics show the impact in grade herds as well, herds where two and three generations of parent is known? Yeah, um, absolutely. What's really neat about this is if you don't know the sire or if it's wrong, it actually tells you who it is. Um, and then once you start building in, it even um, can identify to some extent the maternal grandsire, um, or it can confirm that if you're DHI testing. Um, so, you know, if you're DHI testing, you're going to have a little bit more of a leg up than if you're not. Um, but again, we also have herds that have been um, bull bred, and they are also implementing this technology and, and now investing in even AI sires. So it's all a good thing, I think. And it just, um, again, the more information you have, the more, the more you'll see with it over time. But it, it certainly is going to gain you, again, from in a great commercial herd from the, the low to mid 20s and jump up into the mid to upper 60s for reliability. Okay. And viewer 28 asks, as genomic selection uh, intensity, intensity increases, is inbreeding not a concern? That's a very good question. And um, maybe in our second um, webinar, we can address that a little bit more. But I think if you're thinking on the, on the bull side, there is definitely a, a big challenge that the AI industry has to have. Um, on the female side, yes, we'll have maybe just a tiny bit more over time, but again, if, it depends on how you're using and how you're picking animals to test. If you're, if you're kind of panning for gold or just picking a few animals to test, you're going to kind of, you're, you're more likely to build in more inbreeding likely than a herd that is testing everything, which pretty much most of every herd that I worked with, they were testing all of their heifer calves. And when you do that, you're going to find those oddballs that really get the best of the best of the genes and go from the bottom half of the herd to the top. And they often have very different pedigrees than the ones that are um, based on parentage information are going to be um, higher ranked. So um, there, you can um, also decrease inbreeding if you um, knew more about that and did some matings with genomics. We're not there yet today. Um, at least I don't know of anybody doing that, but um, I think we've got more potential for that. And, and some inbreeding is also good. So it's just managing the inbreeding to acceptable levels. Okay. And Richard asks, if you were starting out with a commercial herd, uh, which K test would you suggest uh, for getting uh, in the process? Well, you know, I'm a little biased here, but, <laughs> but of course, I would I would um, look at a, I would look though at a chip that's at least uh, greater than 10,000 SNPs. Um, so I you know, like our clarified test fits dairies very very well. Um, and it provides you with parentage information. It provides you with GPTAs. It provides you with condi genetic conditions and haplotypes that will allow you to make better breeding decisions and use it in mating programs. Um, and the other piece to this is, again, it's more than just the data that you you're really want to work with, because this, this is not just an easy thing to do when you're actually applying it. Um, I'd find a company, you know, that really invests in their people to try to help you with the process. And that's what we've tried to dedicate a lot of our time and our efforts and education with our sales force to help producers with the process. So and it's more than just the results. It's, it's what do you do with it, and that's the biggest question. Um, on behalf of everyone who attended today, I do want to thank uh, Cheryl for taking the time to uh, inform us so much about this. It's been great. There's a lot of information there, even if you have uh, familiar with genomics. Uh, there was a lot of useful information there.